So who am I with right now? Who are you? I'm with Memphis Jim Giles. I'm just an urban farmer in the community. Okay. Actually, you're more than just an urban farmer in the community. Metric, see, now I have to, I'm going to do the interview for you. Oh, all right. <laughs> Metric is an environmentalist. He's a social activist. And he is one of the big brothers in the community. I mean, right now, we're at a point where, uh, where we're the old folks in the community. And... And so you've, been, you've really taken that seriously and helping the generations behind us and helping folks right now. But the thing I want to focus on with you right now is food. And, and what I've been doing is collecting food stories from people. Food stories that can focus on anything. Uh, like your favorite food, what do you remember growing up with, what do you talk about over dinner, uh, what's your favorite food you like to prepare, how did you learn to cook, or do you know how to cook? All those are questions that, that are fair. Alright, so some of these things, when we talk about food, I'm going to talk a little bit about food, but some of it has to do with how we grow food, and the socialism of our food, and the politics that has to do with All that stuff has to do with food, and how within our urban community that food is now not like a hobby. It's a central part of healthy well-being, and that's a very important thing. My earliest recollection of what is favorite to me is tea cakes. Okay. And fried for potato pie. Tea cakes. Who made that? My grandmother made tea cakes. Okay. And I ask people all the time, do they know how to make tea cakes? It's a southern delicacy. Not everyone knows how to make it. When I look at a southern cookbook, I look in the back and the index to see if they have tea cakes in there. <laughs> you know, if they have tea cakes in the real bona fide southern. <laughs> so that's your standard. Right. Tea cake recipe. Tea cakes yeah. and or fried pie. Okay. A fried pie is kind of like an apple did. turnover, but my mother used to put them on the ceiling, filling in it, sweet potato filling, and do it right on top of it. We used to carry those for uh, lunch. I used to have tea cakes and fried pies for uh, lunch all the time. So that's something that's really kind of special and endearing to me. And then, uh, now, we, let me ask you, do you know how to prepare the tea cakes? With your I, I have shared with people how to prepare them. Uh -huh. I, I, not the tea cakes, but the fried pie. Fried pie I had a friend who actually made super tea cakes. And she's still making tea cakes in Baton Rouge, um, like Louisiana right now. She makes those at the business and sells those. Okay. And, um, that's a very special connection I had when growing up in my youth that we deal with me. Um, Mason City, Iowa. I mean, the folks in Chicago, that's where I was born. We always had a garden. And so in Chicago, we had the garden all the time, family-wise. Giles always did that. But that's because of our um, Mississippi, Alabama roots. And, and we would go down there, and you know, it was like near me, you know, you know things stay out of the field. So yeah, somehow it was kind of like instilled in me. Then we went to Mason City, Iowa. It was rabbits, you know, squirrels, lessons, you know, raccoons, all those type of things. But they always had healthy food, and they had something that we don't have a lot of here, which is orchards. There was a lot of orchards, so that's why orchards is kind of like an area that I really want to move into more intensely, you know. And um, kind of like the thing that with the orchards that we had, it wasn't just like where we went and picked them. It was kind of like a level of socialization where we played among them, where we, we interacted, you know. It was a, a place of interaction uh, with the great vibes and all those things. Um, so it's always been that way. We come here, we still have the, the growing up of food. Um, green, that's one of my favorite foods. A couple years, well, probably many years ago, not that long ago. This woman from uh, Louisiana probably how to make more like Southern style food. And you know, I came up with the boiling of the, of the greens in the water. Put the greens in, pour a lot of water on it, throw some salt pork, lay it on it, throw some 
turkey and, and, and kind of boil it. She told me how to do the, the, the batter in the beginning. You know, you take your pot, you put a little oil in it, you prepare the onions and the peppers and whatever else you want in them, and you get that base real, really good set. And then you take your greens, chop them up a little bit, throw them in the pot, put them to the top, throw a cup, two cups of water at the most, have them on high, let them wilt it down. If you're doing mixed greens, so you start with your collards, do your kale, do your turnips, your mustards, but in that order, kind of like, maybe your mustards and your turnips, and, just let it, and then it's done in about two hours. What? And, and that's how I cook my greens now. And that's how I taught my uh, daughter and children to cook their greens. And I use that as a base for uh, chicken noodle soup and almost all of my cooking. That you prepare the taste of it and season the taste so you know what it's going to taste so you got time to season water. You know, you just described like this, this tradition of growing your food to expand now like four generations, at least the way you talk about it. With your your folks, then are your grandparents, you, and then uh, now your children as well too. I mean, they're passing this thing straight now. And the funny thing is, this is like the second green recipe that we've gotten today, <laughs> and it's almost kind of the same. This last green recipe. I mean, it really makes me think. One of the next projects I want to do is a collard green cook-off. Because everybody got their best collard green recipe. Right. And, you know, and collards, I mean, all these leafy stuff, I right? think collards might be the word uh, universally connecting type of uh, uh, vegetable. I mean, there's a lot of different vegetables. Yeah, right. like, like when I tell people, uh, avocado is my favorite. Yeah. And like, some yeah. people go with it, some people don't. But That's I don't know people. anyone that doesn't like green. Yeah. Some form of green. Even the Swiss chard, you know, which is, is a healthy green too, which, you know, there's some cultural connection. I mean, significant culture, you know. Europeans like Swiss chard. They know about Swiss chard. A lot of Europeans don't, might not know about mustard greens or no green. Greens, but, but I think the big place about the gardening experiences is that we have that. If I didn't know about Swiss chard coming up, it's through my gardening connections that now I know about Swiss chard. And that's how we move past our silos of uh, what we stay in, uh, what we eat, what we think, and how we. Just, you know, uh, perception. Right. You know, on that point, one of the things you talked about no, at the beginning was politics of food. Because I know that you're in this, not just because of tradition, but also want to change the food system. Uh, to change the food system, what I would like overall is like in the zoning of urban farming, uh, is that we include green space as a component of the zoning issues. And we start by doing an assessment of the different areas. So if we can do it through our, in St. Paul, we can do it through our district council. And we, we do that analysis on what do we have as far as green space. So that might, if we do it like a 10 by square area, 12 by, have a designated area and say, well, do, do that area have green space? Because there needs to be a green space that for every, so yeah. many specific areas. That's a big yeah. a natural component. And they do that in certain places. And they make sure they do it in very subjectively in areas that is more predominant of Europeans, uh, social status, you know, money wise. And they need to do that on an equitable level across everywhere else. So I think we have to have a mandate to make that happen. So we do that square space, I mean the assessment. If there is green space, green. How do we utilize it in a way that is comes back to benefit the total community? You know, it may be a point story to the land. But if there isn't, we don't tear down the house to make it that way. But if it, be, if it becomes available and a house is demolished or something, we say, okay, let's say, is there green space here? If not, let's get set that thing that has green space. Way back in William Penn and way back in then, they, that's what, that was in, in uh, Benjamin Franklin and all those days. They said that was a major component of the community. Right. That you had to that have that. Green. Yeah, you had exactly. to have that. So we need to get back to some of those practices.
but but the other the, the other piece of it is that with the uh, the land, how do we want to get back to the place of kind of the basic everyday ironing of the land? I, it's kind of like one of my best fears is people throwing stuff out the window, out the cars and everything, you know. And you know we talk about the. Um, pesticides and all that type of stuff. How do we become true stewards of the land? So when I, I talk about that, in order to become true stewards of the land, we're recognizing that on a bigger level, like, you know, with the uh, global warming and everything. I think in, I watch movies about this universal global warming and all that type of stuff. What are we doing here in our home? In order to get there, we have to start here having that recognition. And there's different levels of it. Broad count farm is one way to get it. It's not one way of doing it. You know? There's not no one way of doing it. But then, when we do need to come back to a common message that whoever is doing it, that we all start doing it that way. You know, I mean, with the common message of honoring the land. Can we understand that we have to honor the land and that the one thing that we don't want to do anymore is dominate the land and be masters of the land. Which gets me back to that point, if we don't want to do that, we need to stop saying we're masters of the land. <laughs> all right? We have to stop saying we're masters of the land, you know? I mean, it's all right, you know? The, and because most of the oppression, most of racial uh, uh, oppression comes from a place of institutions and policies. And so when we talk about growing food, I think the place that we have to start with is that we had to move away from all those colonial practices that we had. We can't say, well, this part is what we want to work on, but we let that piece go by. So, and we talk about equity. Equity means one, decision making about how we grow food, the GMO products, I had to be a part of that. The people who are eating the food had to become part of these conversations. And I heard a guy say once, he said, well, if you say you're trying, and I'm looking out here and I'm not seeing those people who are the stakeholders being present, then you aren't doing a good enough job. So I'm not saying that people aren't doing anything. People are doing a whole lot of good things. But we had to step it up a little bit more to become more intentional and move beyond our boxes, our paradigms of how we engage people, engage people, which is what is so great about that, uh, the, the, the community meal, you know, is bringing people together. Well, uh, Andrew Carnegie, he said, you know, his philosophy was you, you bring people uh, together for a non-adversarial thing, a good thing, and then you can bring in the one or two good things. How I many things that you really want to work and focus on change? Absolutely. That's, so, yeah, so that's, that's a good the whole thing. intention behind it. And that's, yeah. that's how we do that. We have to figure out how we bring people together so we can share stories, so we can have conversations. So, I, so, so the growing of the food, I think, is probably the one common thing. Not only the growing, but the eating the food and coming to the table. I don't know any better way to bring people together, to share those stories, to share those conversations, to move from our differences to a collective together. Which is what it's all about. Thank you, Metro. All right.